Whitaker Chambers does not want to testify before the House Un-American Activities Committee. In fact, he prays it won't come to that. Yet he senses that testifying about his past role as a communist agent might be the event, as he puts it, for which my whole life has been lived. You see, despite his communist past, Chambers has come to believe that communism is a clear and present danger. He believes it threatens his country's very existence and that he has a patriotic duty to testify. So on August 3rd, 1948, Chambers enters a congressional hearing room to answer questions from House members. What Chambers said that day set in motion events that changed America. It led to the trial of a high-ranking former State Department official, Elger Hiss, for perjury. And that case, in turn, had far-reaching political effects. It catapulted an obscure California congressman named Richard Nixon to national fame. It set the stage for Senator Joseph McCarthy's notorious communist hunting. Finally, the case marked the beginning of a conservative intellectual and political movement that, decades later, would put Ronald Reagan in the White House. In his testimony before the House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC, Chambers claimed to have left the Communist Party in 1938. The next year, two days after Hitler and Stalin signed their pact, Chambers went to Washington on a mission. He told authorities what he knew about the infiltration of the government by communists. Chambers testified that he was surprised and disappointed to find that his report failed to produce much of a follow-up from the administration. In response to questions, Chambers identified the persons who he had nine years earlier reported as being active in the communist underground. One of those people was Alger Hiss. Hiss played key roles in the State Department. For example, Hiss took the lead role in organizing the United States side of the Yalta Conference. The committee questioned Chambers about his association with Hiss, who by the time of the hearing had left the State Department. He had become the president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Chambers described their former relationship as very close. He testified that he spent time in the Hiss home with Alger and his wife Priscilla. He described a final meeting in the Hiss home. Chambers said he begged Elger to leave the Communist Party, but Hiss was a true believer. He cried when we separated, Chambers said, but he absolutely refused to break. Chambers' accusation against Hiss got a lot of media play. Hiss decided he could not ignore the charges. In what proved to be a monumental mistake, he sent a telegram to HUAC's chairman in which he categorically denied Chambers' charges. This is telegram read, I do not know Mr. Chambers, and so far as I am aware, have never laid eyes on him. There is no basis for the statements about me made to your committee. I would further appreciate the opportunity of appearing before your committee. Chambers and Hiss were two men who could hardly have been more different, sharing only an impressive intelligence. Alger Hiss was a tall, handsome, Harvard-trained lawyer with an impeccable pedigree. Whitaker Chambers was a short, stocky, and rumpled Columbia dropout and a confessed former communist from a poor and troubled Philadelphia family. One of these two men was lying. The other was telling the truth. It was that simple. If Chambers was telling the truth, then Hiss, during the period from 1933 to 1938, was a dedicated communist engaged in espionage, even while working at the highest levels of the United States government. If Hiss was telling the truth, he served his country with unflinching loyalty and never became a member of the Communist Party. For first-term congressman and HUAC member Richard Nixon, Chambers' story rang true. At the time, the House Un-American Activities Committee was an often ridiculed political backwater. Soon it would become the most talked about committee in Congress. The committee granted Hiss's wish to testify before a packed house. Hiss calmly and confidently told committee members, 
I am not and never have been a member of the Communist Party. He repeated the statement in his telegram that he had never laid eyes on Chambers. Then he added, I would like to have the opportunity to do so. This his performance impressed committee members enough that most concluded that the investigation should be dropped. President Truman went so far as to call the spy inquiry a red herring. One member of the committee, however, wanted to press on with the investigation. Congressman Nixon found his condescending and insulting in the extreme. This is Eastern Ivy League pedigree and style didn't sit well with Nixon, a wittier college graduate and the product of working class parents. With some reluctance, the committee voted to make Nixon chair of a subcommittee that would seek to determine who was lying, Hiss or Chambers. As a starting point, Nixon sought to answer the question of whether they actually knew each other. At the federal courthouse in New York City, Nixon asked Chambers a series of questions to, de to design to determine if he knew him as well as he claimed. Chambers had most of the answers. He told Nixon and his subcommittee about Hiss's nicknames, habits, pets, vacations, and mannerisms. He even gave the subcommittee description of a floor plan and furniture that the Hiss home had. On the question of whether Hiss had any hobbies, Chambers provided an answer that would come to haunt Hiss. Yes, he did. He and Priscilla both had the same hobby, amateur ornithologists, bird observers. They used to get up early in the morning to observe birds. I recall once they saw, to their great excitement, a prothonotary warbler. After the Chambers interview, his face questioning from the committee in executive session. Chairman J. Parnell Thomas told Hiss that either Chambers had made a study of your life in great detail, or he knows you. Hiss was shown two photographs of Chambers. Thomas asked Hiss whether he still maintained he did not recognize the man who claimed to have spent a week in his house. Hiss answered, I do not recognize him from that picture. I want to hear the man's voice. After a morning recess, Hiss announced that he now believed that his accuser might be a man he knew in the 1930s as George Crosley. Hiss said Crosley, he knew, claimed to be a freelance writer who was seeking information about Hiss's work on a congressional committee dealing with the munitions industry. Crosley's most memorable feature, according to Hiss, was his very bad teeth. A turning point in the investigation came when Richard Nixon asked, What hobby, if any, do you have, Mr. Hiss? Hiss answered that his hobbies were tennis and amateur ornithology. Congressman John McDowell jumped in. Did you ever see a prothonotary warbler? Hiss fell into the trap. He answered enthusiastically, I have, right here on the Potomac. Do you know that place? Hiss's response convinced previously skeptical committee members that Chambers told the truth. It seemed implausible that Chambers could have known a detail like the sighting of a rare warbler through a general study of Hiss's life. The story had to come from first-hand knowledge. At an August 17th UAC hearing, Hiss met his accuser. He asked to look at Chambers' teeth. Then Nixon called on both Chambers and Hiss to stand up. Nixon said to Hiss, I ask you now if you've ever known that man before. Turning to Chambers, Hiss asks, Are you George Crosley? Chambers replied, Not to my knowledge. You are Elger Hiss, I believe. Hiss told the committee that Chambers was probably the man he knew as Crosley. He proceeded to ask Chambers some questions, ostensibly to resolve his doubts as to whether in fact he was the man he knew. The questions mostly backfired. Then he announced, I am now perfectly prepared to identify this man as George Crosley. Committee members followed up the encounter with a number of tough questions directed at Hiss. Chairman Thomas ended the session with the words, That is all. Thank you very much. Hiss replied testily, I don't reciprocate. 
Eight days later, for the first time in history, television cameras were present for a congressional hearing. The committee confronted Hiss with a host of questions about an alleged lease of Hiss's apartment to Chambers and the transfer to Chambers of Hiss's old 1929 Ford. One congressman wondered aloud about a person of Hiss's intellect who gives to casual people his apartment and who tosses in an automobile. In the afternoon session, Chambers called Hiss a devoted and at the time rather romantic communist who now represents the concealed enemy against which we are all fighting. HUAC concluded its investigation with a report calling Hiss's testimony vague and evasive. As for the testimony of Chambers, the committee described it as forthright and emphatic. In response, Hiss published a 14-page letter attacking the committee for, quote, using its great powers and prestige of the United States Congress to help sworn traitors to besmirch any American they can pick upon. On October 8th, Hiss filed an ill-advised slander suit against Chambers. The complaint alleged that Chambers lied on Meet the Press when he said Hiss was, was a communist and may be now. Hiss's attorneys began an investigation into Chambers' background, hoping to dig up dirt that would destroy his credibility. Investigators looked into whether Chambers had ever been treated for mental illness or whether he was ever involved in homosexual relationships. In the middle of a deposition for the slander suit, Hiss's attorney asked that Chambers produce any correspondence, either typewritten or in handwriting, from any members of the Hiss family. The request sent Chambers to the Brooklyn home of his nephew's mother. There he reached into a dumbwaiter shaft in the bathroom and pulled out a large weathered envelope. The envelope contained four notes handwritten by Elger Hiss, 65 typewritten copies of State Department documents, and five strips of 35 millimeter film. The documents, if genuine, proved more than that Hiss knew Chambers long after 1936, when Hiss claimed to have last seen Crosley. They proved Hiss engaged in espionage. Chambers turned over the documents to his lawyers, keeping the 35 millimeter film for himself. When he received the packet of materials, Hiss's attorney was bewildered and flustered. The documents blew his client's slander suit out of the water and put Hiss in grave danger of a criminal indictment. Chambers explained his delay in producing the incriminating documents as an effort to spare an old friend from more trouble than was necessary. He said he produced the materials only when he became convinced, quote, Hiss was determined to destroy me and my wife if possible. Then the other big shoe to drop. Chambers had placed the 35 millimeter film he held back from attorneys into a hollowed out pumpkin. He then placed the pumpkin back in a pumpkin patch on his Maryland farm. On a December evening in 1948, Chambers accompanied two HUAC investigators to his farm, where he led them to the pumpkin patch and showed them the hollowed out pumpkin. The film and the pumpkin included photographs of State and Navy Department documents. For the rest of the Hiss Chambers controversy, the press, enjoying the alliteration, referred to the entire set of documents and photographs as the Pumpkin Papers. The Pumpkin Papers changed everything. The question of whether Hiss knew Chambers better than he admitted, or even whether he was a communist, became inconsequential. The question instead became whether Elger Hiss, high State Department official, was a Soviet agent. Fortunately for Hiss, the statute of limitations for espionage at the time was five years. The incriminating evidence all concerned documents passed over a decade earlier. The statute of limitations did not help Hiss, however, on the question of whether his recent remarks about Chambers constituted perjury. Wearing a gray herringbone suit and a brown hat, Hiss entered the federal courthouse in Manhattan in May 1949 for the first day of his perjury trial. He faced two counts, both stemming from testimony before a federal grand jury. 
This was charged with lying when he testified that he had never gave any documents to Whitaker Chambers, and when he claimed never to have seen Chambers after January 1, 1937. In his opening statement, Assistant U.S. Attorney Thomas Murphy told the jury, if you don't believe Chambers, then we have no case. Murphy said the prosecution had no photographs of the man lying, but would instead corroborate Chambers' testimony by the typewriting and the handwriting. Defense attorney Lloyd Paul Stryker, in his opening statement, said his client welcomed the quiet and fair court of justice after the Klieg lights, the television, and all of the propaganda which surrounded the beginning of this story. Stryker said that the trial would show the contrast between his client, without a blot or blemish on him, and Chambers, a voluntary conspirator against the land that I love and you love. Whitaker Chambers was the prosecution's central witness. He testified that Hiss began passing him State Department documents in early 1937. Hiss, he said, followed the espionage procedures recommended by a Soviet agent. He brought the, home, the files home nightly, and he retyped them. On cross-examination, Stryker tried to highlight defects in Chambers' character. He asked about a play written by Chambers as a student at Columbia, which included what the lawyer called an offensive treatment of Christ. He asked whether he'd ever been to a dive in New Orleans and been with a prostitute named One-Eyed Annie. Chambers said no. He demanded to know whether Chambers was, for some 14 years, an enemy and traitor of the United States of America. Chambers answered, that is right. Chambers' wife, Esther, followed Whitaker to the stand. She told jurors of the close relationship that she and her husband enjoyed for several years with Alger and Priscilla Hiss. She described visits to Hiss's apartment in Baltimore. The prosecution next called a series of witnesses who tied Hiss to the typewritten State Department documents introduced by the government. One of these witnesses, a former secretary in Hiss's State Department office, testified that Hiss often took departmental documents home from work. But the most critical testimony tying Hiss to the documents came from an FBI laboratory expert. The expert told jurors that various letters known to have been typed by Hiss in 1936 and 1937 were typed on the same Woodstock typewriter as the papers found in the Brooklyn dumbwaiter shaft. He based his conclusion on similarities between certain letters, such as an unusual lowercase g on both sets of papers. The defense tried to persuade jurors of three things. First, that Hiss's reputation was so good that his alleged espionage activity was unthinkable. Second, that Chambers was mentally unstable and should not be believed. And third, that Hiss's Woodstock typewriter had been given to Claudia Catlett, a household employee, sometime before 1938, making it impossible for either Alger or Priscilla Hiss to have used it to retype the State Department documents. Three members of Claudia Catlett's family tried to bolster the defense by testifying that the Woodstock typewriter was in their possession during the time period in question. One family member testified that typewriter keys kept jamming. To fix the problem, the typewriter was brought in 1937 to a repair shop on K Street, just off Connecticut Avenue. Prosecutor Murphy undermined the testimony on cross-examination by pointing out a problem. Supposing I tell you, he said, that the Woodstock repair shop on Connecticut and K did not come in exist into existence until the September of 1938. The defense team produced an impressive batch of character witnesses for Hiss. The list included two U.S. Supreme Court justices, a former Solicitor General, and both a former presidential nominee, John W. Davis, and a future presidential nominee, Adlai Stevens. But would their good opinion of Hiss's reputation sway the jury? When Hiss himself took the stand, he admitted writing the four handwritten notes produced by Chambers but he denied any connection with the microfilm found in Chambers' pumpkin or any role in typing the 65 State Department documents. 
He also insisted, as he had told the grand jury, that he had not met Chambers on any occasion after January 1, 1937. Stryker spared nothing in his attack on Whitaker Chambers in his summation to the jury. He called Chambers an enemy of the Republic, a blasphemer of Christ, a disbeliever in God, with no respect for matrimony or motherhood. Hiss, on the other hand, is an honest and falsely accused gentleman. He closed by expressing confidence that for his client, Elger Hiss, this long nightmare is drawing to a close. Prosecutor Murphy told the jurors that their duty was clear. The evidence left only one inference that could be drawn, that the defendant gave secret State Department documents to Chambers. He ended his summation by asking the jurors to come back and put the lie in that man's face. On July 6, 1949, the case went to the jury. Late the next afternoon, the jury sent a note saying it was unable to reach a verdict. Judge Kaufman urged the jury to make one final effort to reach a conclusion. But within hours, the jury came back again, reporting itself hopelessly deadlocked. A mistrial was declared. Quizzed about the deliberations, jurors revealed that the final vote stood eight for conviction, four for acquittal. The months between the end of the first Hiss trial and the start of the second were very eventful. The Soviet Union exploded an atomic bomb. The Red Army of Mao Zedong drove the forces of Chiang Kai-shek to the island of Formosa. And perhaps most ominously for Elger Hiss, polls showed public attitudes shifting towards harsher treatment of U.S. communists. The second trial began with a somewhat changed cast. Murphy was back as prosecutor, but Claude Cross now led the Hiss defense. Judge Kaufman, criticized for his pro-defense rulings in the first trial, was replaced on the bench by Henry Goddard. The defense case in the second trial placed heavy reliance on the testimony of its expert psychiatrist, Dr. Carl A. Binger. On direct examination, Dr. Binger confidently offered his thoughts about the mental state of Chambers based almost solely on his reading of Chambers' writings and his observation of his trial testimony. Binger called Chambers a psychopathic personality and a pathological liar. What followed was one of the most famous and devastating cross-examinations in courtroom history. In it, Prosecutor Murphy destroyed Binger's credibility. Murphy attempted to show through his questioning that the label psychopathic personality was a useless and empty catch-all for a lot of symptoms. For example, Binger had concluded the chamber's tendency to look up at the ceiling from the witness chair was a symptom of a psychopathic personality. So Murphy asked Dr. Binger what should be made of the fact that the prosecution had counted Binger himself eyeing the ceiling 50 times in less than an hour during his testimony. Murphy also asked about another alleged symptom of Chambers' psychopathic personality, his untidiness and lack of concern about his appearance. Murphy noted that many other famous persons were well known for their untidiness. Did Binger think that Albert Einstein Bing Crosby and Thomas Edison were psychopaths. Murphy zeroed in on Binger's, ar Binger's argument that Chambers' equivocations were a sign of a psychopathic personality. He asked the doctor what conclusions should be drawn from the fact that there were 158 equivocations by Elger Hiss in his 550 pages of testimony. Finally, Murphy attacked Binger's conclusion that hiding microfilm in a pumpkin was indicative of a psychopathic personality. Murphy asked about other famous hidings in history. Did the mother of Moses, who hid her little child in the bulrushes, have a serious personality disorder? After the cross-examination finished, one commentator wrote, Mr. Murphy just wanted plain answers to plain questions about the most alarming assignment anyone would wish on a psychiatrist. In his summation, Claude Cross conceded that the stolen documents had been typed on the Woodstock typewriter once owned by Hiss. He insisted, however, that the key question is not what typewriter was used, but who the typist was. Cross suggested that Chambers or a Confederate got their hands on the typewriter 
after it left the possession of Hiss. They used Hiss's typewriter in an effort to frame him. Closing for the prosecution, Murphy told the jurors that the evidence proved Hiss to be a traitor. Hiss was in love with their philosophy, not ours. The jury returned its verdict on the afternoon of January 20th, 1950, guilty on both perjury counts. Elger Hiss took the news quietly. Five days later, the judge imposed the maximum sentence of five years. Hiss made a brief statement at sentencing. He expressed confidence that in the future, the full facts of how Whitaker Chambers was able to carry out a forgery by typewriter will be disclosed. Hiss served 44 months of his sentence at Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary in Pennsylvania before being released for good behavior. Even though the case produced a relatively light sentence, it set in motion a chain of events that forever changed American politics. Joseph McCarthy, a little-known senator from Wisconsin, seized on the Hiss conviction to charge that the Department of State was thoroughly infested with communists. He opened divisive hearings, the controversial witch hunt that plagued American society in the 1950s. Chambers disassociated himself from McCarthy's crusade. Chambers said, for the right to tie itself in any way to Senator McCarthy is suicide. He is a raven of disaster. The fame Richard Nixon gained from his role in the Hiss case attracted the attention of the 1952 Republican nominee for president, General Dwight Eisenhower. Eisenhower selected Nixon as his running mate. And of course, Nixon would use that as a springboard for his own later run for the presidency. Even more significantly, the Hiss Chambers case spanned the anti-communist embers that within a decade evolved into a grassroots conservative movement in the Republican Party. In 1964, the movement produced the nomination of Barry Goldwater. In 1980, the election of Ronald Reagan. The Chambers Hiss case did no less than change the course of political thought in America. As Lionel Trilling observed, before Hiss, liberalism was not only the dominant, but even the sole intellectual tradition. A big tri driver of political change was Whitaker Chambers' own 1952 autobiography, Witness. In the book, which is unquestionably one of the greatest of all American autobiographies, Chambers wrote of a contest between two faiths, communism and freedom. Two faiths were on trial, Chambers observed, and human societies, like human beings, live by faith and die when faith dies. Sidney Hook, reviewing Witness in the New York Times Book Review in 1952, wrote, it throws more light on the conspiratorial and religious character of modern communism, on the tangled complex motives which led men and women of goodwill to immolate themselves on the altar of fancied historical necessity, than all of the hundred great books of the past combined. Ronald Reagan saw witness as a political watershed in fact, Reagan credited Chambers' book as causing his own transformation from a New Deal Democrat to a conservative Republican. Throughout his political career, Reagan made repeated references to Chambers in his speeches. He said that Chambers sparked the counter-revolution of the intellectuals, and that Chambers' story represents a generation's return to eternal truths and fundamental values. On March 26, 1984, Chambers posthumously received from President Reagan, the nation's highest honor, the Medal of Freedom. As for Elger Hiss, in the 46 years he lived after his perjury conviction, he never deviated from his claim of innocence, but he and his supporters found their case weakened in the mid-1990s. The new evidence came in the form of the Venona cables, intercepted communications from the Soviet agents in the United States to Moscow. The intercepted cables suggested that Hiss was a Soviet agent, who supported the communist cause at the 1945 Yalta Conference. Writing in the New York Observer in 2001, Ron Rosenbaum offered a theory to explain why Hiss continued to find support from many in the American left, what Rosenbaum called the half-deliberate blindness of so many decent people. Hiss's supporters often 
pointed to Hiss's dogged insistence on his innocence as a reason for their own belief in his innocence. Hiss continued to encourage generations of researchers, volunteers, and true believers to devote a good part of their lives to him and his cause. The central argument of his supporters can be summed up in a question. You don't think that he would have gotten all these people to work on his case if he wasn't innocent, do you? Rosenbaum had a different explanation for Hiss's refusal to admit his guilt. As he saw it, Hiss was proud of having maintained his innocence. Proud even if it meant stringing along his well-meaning defenders. Because he never stopped believing that the cover-up of his work for the Soviets was a principled necessity. The confrontation between Chambers and Hiss contributed to the polarization of the political left and the political right. Chambers saw the world as a battle between godless communists and Christian anti-communists, a battle between darkness and light. Liberals largely rejected that division, seen as arrogant and overly simplistic. Where you stood determined what you saw, then and to this day.